thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. I also have another connection with Nebraska. Judge Johnson, who I'm sure many of you know from Omaha, is actually a, a close friend and colleague and was a fellow of Zero to Three. Um, Zero to Three has early career and mid-career fellows, and obviously Judge Johnson was a mid-career fellow. But um, we have an interesting connection. Um, so I was in Nebraska doing a training for the National Council of Juvenile Family Court Judges a number of years ago with Judge Lederman and some other people. Were you there? So I'm sitting at dinner with Judge Johnson, who I never met before. You know, and Johnson's, you know, not the most unusual name. And he says to me, um, I wonder if you know my brother from New Orleans. And so I thought, hmm, Johnson, who knows? And his, his brother is, is Ben Johnson, actually, who at that time was head of the Greater New Orleans Foundation. He actually just stepped down the last year, and I know him very well. And so we felt this immediate connection. Well, he has a lot of ties to New Orleans, in fact, was married in New Orleans and knows the bishop there very well. And so, um, but we also know how incredibly innovative he is in court. And so when I mentioned the zero to three fellowship, so um, I've been involved with Zero to Three for a long time, and we started this leadership development initiative probably about 10 years ago, although there were fellowships earlier. And at that time, I was working really closely with Judge Lederman in Miami, and, um, you know, I thought judges really needed to know more about early development, and Judge Lederman and I met. I can tell you that story, too, but, you know, how I get connected with judges in that way. Well, actually, I'll tell you how we met and how this evolved, because it's actually relevant to what's happening here and Judge Johnson has been one of the people who, you know, has been instrumental in getting this all going, certainly in Nebraska, but also nationally, because he's, I guess, at some point president-elect. I don't know where, whether he's, he's still president-elect of the National Council of Juvenile Family Court Judges. But um, so Judge Lederman and I had never met. We were on a National Research Council Committee for Evaluation of Family Violence Interventions. And in the court, these committees deliberate for a number of years and you meet for two or three days and you get to know people pretty well. And so there were lots and lots of people advocating for the women, which they should. Battered women need advocates. But there were very few people advocating for the children. And so Judge Lederman and myself, and actually there was a police lieutenant from <coughs> Dallas and a lawyer who worked with um, Scott Harshberger, who was then, I believe, Attorney General in Massachusetts. But anyhow, so we kept talking about the children. And we kept realizing we were the only ones talking about the children. And so anyhow, we finally, that report actually is out, was out a number of years ago. And there is a component on the children. But I have to tell you that they kept sending me back drafts and the stuff on the children, particularly the young children, wasn't in there. And I finally sent them back the fourth time. And I said, don't send me another draft. I'm not signing off on it till the children are in there. So anyhow, after that, Judge Lederman called me and she said, you know, I'm starting this program related to, she had some VAWA money, uh, domestic violence and uh, child maltreatment. Would I be interested in consulting with her? And I said, sure, it sounded interesting. We started that. And in the course of our working together, I kept talking to her more and more about the young children. She is administrative judge of the juvenile court in Miami-Dade. It's one of the largest jurisdictions in the country. She hears an average of 150 cases a week in dependency court of abuse and neglect. That doesn't mean every week she hears that many cases, but that's a lot of cases. And so we, and, and the majority of children within the child welfare system um, are under the age of five. And I, I was thinking tomorrow, I just sent another PowerPoint. Um, it isn't one that you really need, but it's one that we use a lot just to make sure you have all those statistics because it's very important for this work. And um, so it's, this is relevant to the evolution of what we're doing here and what Judge Johnson is doing and what we're trying to do, not only in Nebraska, but in many places around the country. Um, she was convinced that we needed to do more about the young children, just like Judge Johnson feels like we more need to do more about with the young children. But you know, it's the children that are adjudicated dependent, not the parents. And so she said, finally, after I talked and talked and talked, she said, okay, if you help develop this program, we'll send the children, evaluate the children. And we're talking about little children, you know, under the age of five and often under the age of three. And, you know, and then take those recommendations and use them in court. And I, I said, Judge, with all due respect, um, there's only so much we can do in evaluating young children. We have to evaluate them in the context of the relationship 
bio parent, foster parent, grandparent, whoever they're with. And she said, well, that's problematic from a legal point of view because the parents or caregivers are not, you know, they're not necessarily under the jurisdiction of the court. And I said, would you give me a couple of hours of your time? I'd like to show you some videotapes of some of the kinds of things that we do. And so she said, sure. So we, we sat for two hours in her chamber and I show, in her chambers and I showed her some of the videos that I'll be using today for training. And after that, she said, okay, we're going to do it. We're going to figure out a way to do it. Because what I showed her was what, you know, more than my talking about it, but seeing it on tape, what happens in the relationship and how you can repair things in the relationship. And so that was actually the beginning of this work many years ago. And so then um, I called um, Matthew Melman, who was the executive director of Zero to Three, and I said, you know, have you, and he's actually a lawyer, which is unusual, because usually it would be a child development person or something. And I said, have you ever thought about having a judge as one of our um, fellows? And he said, no, I haven't. I said, well, I'd like to recommend it. And I recommended Judge Lederman as the first judge to start. And she had the first fellowship, and then a, a number of years later, Judge Johnson did. And we've had now, I think, about six judges who's gone through the, who've gone through the fellowship program, and a number of lawyers. Now, one of the things that you know has been very important, and they learn about the science of early childhood development and the application to the courts. One of the things that's that's very important, though, is language. You know so that within the court system there's a certain type of language certainly within mental health and child development there's another type of language and we have to be able to talk each other's language and we have to be able to understand each other so i think that's a very important part of what we do and you know some of it has been very eye opening and for those of you who work with the court or will work with the court you know that there was a case a number of about a year ago in miami where um um, there was a question of whether I'd come and be an expert. It was for another judge, and it ended up that they, they settled the thing. But it was one of these cases with a little boy uh, from Cuba, not the one that, I don't know if you followed the one that Judge Lederman was all over New York Times and CNN, but this was another one last year. And the child had been placed for four years in care in this country, and then the father came over from Cuba and you know, wanted to take the child back to Cuba. And obviously, I say obviously because it was not in the child's best interest to break that relationship. And I said to Judge Lederman, but this is not in the child's best interest. And she said, but there's the law. And when there's the law, it's going to trump at times best interest. And that's something that's awfully hard for us, except that one of the things that we can do is help educate. So that, for example, if a, if a baby is in care somewhere for two years or three years, you don't immediately, you know, have to do that. This was one where there were a lot of legal issues involved. So I just say all that in terms of introduction. And um, I, I hope that, you know, as uh, Vicki Weiss mentioned, that some of you will continue, a group will continue to um, do consultation on this work to have that clinical component in, case, in place for the courts, which is what the goal of all of this is. So what I'm going to do today, I'm going to start doing just a brief overview of infant mental health so we're all on the same page in terms of things that we are focusing on. And you've got most of these PowerPoints. One of the things that happens to me as a, as a trainer, and I know this room isn't ideal because I sort of feel like I have the, I can see all your faces though, I don't have any backs, you know, but um, you know, I, I was trying to think if there was another structure with a big U in here or something like that, but I don't know if everybody could fit. Um, but I, I want to, I want, if you have questions or issues to raise, I'd like you to do it during the course of the training. I'm also a trainer who does not do the same thing all the time. I get all that information out there, but I, I envy people where they have a big manual and they just go through it, and then they use the same tapes or whatever. I don't do that. I change it along the way. So actually, I had to copy a few more PowerPoints that you're going to get tomorrow that I realized that we probably should be covering as well, though I sent a whole bunch of material. So what we're going to do this morning is um, go over just briefly infant mental health and then um, relationship assessment, because the relationship assessment forms the basis of moving into treatment. We see the relationship assessment as the beginning of the treatment of understanding 
the case. And there's, there's no way that you can understand what's going on without evaluating this child, this young child, in the context of a relationship. And if there's more than one relationship, you evaluate them in the context of more than one relationship. So that's a very important part, is that evaluation piece. And then we'll move into the, the treatment piece. Does that make sense? How many of you are familiar with relationship-based evaluations? I assume some of you are, but not that many. OK. And we'll show you the model that we use. It can be adapted um, if people want to adapt it in various ways. The other thing that's so important about the relationship-based evaluation that I'll be going into is we also use it to evaluate what we're doing. So the paper that is in your packet on the Florida Mental Health Pilot, and we're putting together other papers related to that, um, use this evaluation as we first, uh, for intake, the first pre-assessment, and then we use it after the uh, therapeutic intervention for post-assessment. Because as many of you know, and I'm sure I've got a lot of developmentalists here, you know, there are only so many things you can do to evaluate what's going on with a little baby. So this observational assessment is a key to that. And we have, we rate it blind, and we've got inter rater reliability and all of those kinds of things. And so it's a good scientific me method. Actually, I was doing um, supervision with one of the people who was working with me the other day, and he was referred a two-year-old for an evaluation. You know, not, it was for some other reason, and it had to be a developmental evaluation. And so I said, well, what are you going to do? <laughs> you know, I mean, there just is not that much you can do. You can do a Bailey, you know, but, you know, that, so that's why we depend so much on that. So let's just look briefly at infamental. Anybody have any questions or comments so far? Okay. So a couple of things that I want to emphasize from this PowerPoint, just so our context is set for what we're going to be doing. Um, if you look at that first point there, uh, developing capacity of the child birth to three to experience, regulate, and express emotions. OK, experiencing emotions. So how are we going to understand experiencing emotions? We're going to understand it from observing the child. So one of the things that you know, those of us who train, whether it's psychology or social work or counseling, you don't necessarily depend upon your eyes and your observational skills to understand what's going on. But with young children, that's crucial. And that's why we use a lot of videos with what we do. Second point there in terms of regulation, emotion and behavior regulation. So this out of control child or this withdrawn child or the child who's exposed to trauma who then gets dysregulated is a really important part of the work that we do and understand in the work we do. And we'll be talking about a little bit about um, DC-0-3R, Diagnostic Classification 0-3R. Um, How many of you are familiar with DC-0-3R? Oh, not very many, a few. OK, well, those of you who are familiar can help me with that. Um, but what we know is that regulation, you know, a couple of things that are very different about DC-0-3R as compared with DSM has to do with behavior and emotion regulation, which is not something that's well represented. You know, it's going to be lumped in some kind of category with DSM, like adjustment disorder, probably, or something like that. And the relationship on axis two. And actually, one of the good things about DC 0 to 3 R as compared with DC 0 to the first version is that axis two relationship diagnosis. So the only reason I bring that up is that behavior regulation can be understood. So it's not just, um, and I know we have at least one pediatrician in the room, but we get all these referrals for ADHD or whatever else they are. People don't look at the history of trauma or exposure to violence or other kinds of things that leads to dysregulation, regulation problems. OK. Second point there, ability to form close and secure relationships. So that's the foundation of what we're looking at is relationships. And then we're going to be talking a lot about that, both in terms of the evaluation and then in terms of the treatment. So for those of you who are used to doing play therapy with just the child, parental guidance with just the parent, we're going to move that paradigm. They're both going to be there together. It makes it more complicated in some ways, but it also is the way to really affect change. The other thing about um, that I want to emphasize at this point 
is when you have a parent or a caregiver or a child come in and you're going to do a relationship assessment or relationship treatment, um, it's going to raise a lot of questions in your mind, you know? And um, sometimes that is de-skilling for people, you know, that they feel like, um, well, I don't know what to do and I'm not sure what's going on and, you know, and that's not a very comfortable feeling at times. When we do this training, we say, that's what it's about, you know? I see and hear cases day after day after day and, you know, sometimes it jumps out at me, but most of the time it doesn't. You know, so you have to be able to live with that uncertainty and figure out what's going on, and that's the nature of this work. It becomes clearer after a while, you know, but they're all, and you know, and then I thought about it, and I'm also very well trained in adult work. I'm actually um, an adult psychoanalyst. I, you know, went through that training. One of the reasons I went through the training was I wanted more skill. Well, it's great to have adult training if you're going to do child work. You know that because you've got parents or caregivers you know, who've got a lot of their own issues. And, you know, if you only have the child training, it's a little hard to deal with some of those parents. But, you know, if you, for those of you who do adult work, if you have somebody come in for the first time, you don't know what to expect. I mean, I'm not a, a, a cognitive behavioral person. I know cognitive behavioral, but I'm, I'm a psychodynamic person. And you have to figure out what to expect there. Well, it's a little more complicated when you've got the little one there and the parent. But that uncertainty is part of the work, and I only emphasize that. And what you want to see in the child is a child who learns and explores the environment and that growing capacity to learn. So you see language developing, so you see them reaching out and exploring the environment. You see a range of affect and all those types of things that we often don't see in abused and neglected children. Um, there's a focus on, for infant mental health, healthy social and emotional development, not psychopathology. And what we're trying to do is the work that we do, whether it's with the court or in a clinic setting, is to get that child back on track. I like to think about, I work a lot with trauma, and of course all of the children in juvenile court have been exposed to trauma of some sort or other, is I like to think about trauma as that experience, you know, you all know the book, probably The Little Engine That Could, and if you don't, you need to know the book, The Little Engine Could, well this, this, this engine is going up this very steep track. Trauma comes along, throws it off the track. Our job is to try to help get that child back on track, but in the context of a relationship, because we're just an intervener for a while. It's that parent or caregiver who's the one who has to keep that child on track. So you can see that conceptualization of the relationship and how very important that is. So. Um, you've heard me talk about relationships, so that's pretty obvious. Um, and we have to understand both the baby and the relationship. Now, if you have to understand the relationship and you've got problems in the parent psychopathology, um, I don't know what the percentage is in Nebraska, but um, in most courts, dependency courts, somewhere between 80, 95 percent of the uh, parents are substance abusers. Um, I know methamphetamines is a big issue in this part of the country. Um, so one has to deal with that, you know. So if you're going to optimize that relationship, you've got to deal with the substance issues. Um, the other thing that's very prevalent is depression. And often that isn't dealt with. Um, I've had an experience recently, for better or worse, um, of working in, a, in an adult drug court. And you might wonder, why was I working in an adult drug court? Well in St. Bernard Parish, which is right outside New Orleans. Um, the person who used to do consultation with the drug court was elected parish president. This is a, you know, smaller area. This was totally devastated by Hurricane Katrina. And so they needed somebody to fill in very quickly for the drug court. And one of my colleagues, social worker, has a lot of expertise in substance abuse. I you know something about substance abuse. It's not an area that I, I know a lot about trauma. And then um, the work has to be done in the evening, 6 to 9 o'clock in the evening. And a lot of people who work with me have young families. My children are grown. So I agreed to do the adult um, work because they didn't have anybody to do the adult. Well, what I discovered, which actually it was probably very good that I went out there. So I got out there, and at the time there were about eight men and about six women. And we decided, 
you know, since the two of us were there, why not have a woman's group? And so I started a woman's group in the adult drug court. Well, nobody asked them the question. The majority of those women, five out of six, had young children under the age of five. Um, one of them had older children. And, you know, so I started to, as they talked about their issue, ask about the children, you know, and, a, and I learned many years ago, as I'm sure you have, for substance abusing parents, you know, the losses and the separations and the comings and goings, and frequently they come, those who are at this point, I don't like the word addict, but I learned that they use the word addict and you have to use it. They've, many of them, been brought up in families like that as well. And, you know, so I said to one of my colleagues, since we do a, a lot of, you know, work with young children, I said, why hasn't anybody ever paid attention to the fact that these women have babies? You know, and so she actually started a group in addition to my group for them with the babies and there are some wonderful programs in this area. The only reason I mention that is understanding the baby in the relationship, you know, that that complexity of the relationship has to be dealt with in that way. Um, the other thing that um, is very interesting and I know uh, Judge Johnson does a lot, he has his baby court, baby drug court, you know, and I've learned so much from what he talked about there, and that is to try to help the, the mom understand how very important she is for her baby. And also that from our perspective too, that the baby actually can help the mom heal, you know, if you can lock in that relationship. So I only mention that because it's very relevant to the work in courts. So this is just what happens. Uh, as you see, there's much more of a focus here on emotional and social development than there is on cognitive development because that's really what we're, we're um, concentrating on. But at the same time, if emotional and social development is on track, cognitive development will follow. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we see so often with these babies is language delays. We see delays in a number of different areas, but language is the majority. Why is that? Because you need to talk to a baby for a baby to learn language. And if there's neglect going on or other kinds of things a baby isn't being talked to, there may be other issues as well, but that's certainly one of them. Um, again, what do we mean by emotional development? That behavior and emotion regulation comes in the context of the relationship. That's how babies learn that. So we all know that. I, I would guess there are a lot of people in this room who are parents and you know that if a child gets deregulated, dysregulated, all children get dysregulated, there are ways to um, help them with that regulation, talk to them, explain things. Um, if they're upset, you know, distract them, all kinds of things that we do all the time. Well, unfortunately, you know, if you haven't had that experience or somehow learned it, that's something that's really problematic in relationships. And I also very much like the notion of a good enough environment. You know, um, again, for the people who are parents in the room, you know, it was always very, very reassuring to me to think about, oh, well, I'm, you know, a good enough parent. Not going to necessarily do everything right all the time, but good enough. And that's really what our goal is. Um, you know, so we all make mistakes. How many people in this room, as they've raised their children, said to themselves, you know, I'm not going to do what my, my mother did to me, or my father did to me. And then you see yourself doing it with your child. I remember the first time that happened to me with one of my sons who was really pushing my buttons. I thought, oh my God, there I am doing what I just said what I wasn't going to do. You know, so we all know that. But we're good enough. We know that. You know, um, and I think that's important. We all make mistakes, but then we help get back on track. We wouldn't be doing this work if we weren't. Um, so, infants are nurtured in relationship. They learn what people expect of them. Um, but also that last one, and I was talking about the adult's emotional well-being and how important that is. So, I guess the reason I keep emphasizing that is even though we're focusing on the infant, which we are, and the relationship, if that other half of the relationship can provide some type of stability, then we've got to figure that out and uh, help work with that. Um, one of the things that was really striking to me that I hadn't, you know, so one of the good experiences of working in adult drug court 
is I hadn't been exposed as much to the other side of it. You know, what we do is we send them, they get in substance abuse treatment, we see how they're doing, we see if they're compliant, we're seeing how the relationship's going. But when you see the other side of it with these, and they all, the ones I were working with, women, some of the men had, had um, babies too, but I wasn't working with the men. Um, you, you know, one of the things that I said to my colleague, you know, since I do have experience with adult, I said, we've got so much dual diagnosis here that's not being addressed. That's got to be addressed, because how are they going to be able to deal with staying, you know, um, consistent in their recovery and with their substance abuse treatment if they've got all these other mental health issues that aren't being addressed? And one of the other things that was interesting to me as I was picking up on that, so I would get each of them in for a referral for mental health to our clinic, and just about when they were going to go in, they would relapse. I had that happen with three of them. So obviously I was picking up something, but either it wasn't soon enough or whatever was going on. Those of you who work with this population know it can be very frustrating. <laughs> and so we're actually writing a grant now that I hope the drug court will put in so that we have upfront in the very beginning much better evaluations, which is what programs need. For any of you who are interested in this area, by the way, I've just accepted a paper for the Infamental Health Journal. I edit the Infamental Health Journal by Stacy Bromberg and another colleague and Karen Frankel who work out of Denver. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the work of Bob Harmon. He died a couple of years ago suddenly, unfortunately, of a heart attack. But he started this program, The Havens, in Denver, um, which is a program for uh, pregnant and parenting, substance abusing uh, moms and babies. And this paper that they wrote is just really good. And this model is one that's just fantastic. So it just, if you want to look on the relationship aspects, and if anybody's interested in that paper, I'll be glad to send it. It's not going to be out probably for nine months or so, but it's really, really good. Okay, so um, one of the other things that's so important as we work with these mothers or fathers, and I, we do have fathers, about 10% of our cases are fathers um, in the court setting, is to help them understand how a child communicates so they don't have language. And particularly if they're language delayed, they have less language. So how do they communicate? They communicate with their behavior. And the less language they have, sometimes the worse the behavior becomes because it's the only way they have to communicate. They communicate by crying. <laughs> they communicate by all kinds of things that are not the most positive, And people have to understand that's the only way they can communicate. Um, but that's the way they develop in relationships and with other people. Um, I just wanted to, that, I'm not going to go into mastery motivation, but it's just, you know, the child explores the environment and learns in that way. It's just a component of infant mental health. And I thought if you're going to do this work, I wanted you to have that PowerPoint on infant mental health. Culture is very important. What kind of different um, cultural groups do you have here in Nebraska? Um, anybody tell me a little bit about that and things that you have to be sensitive to related to culture? Anybody want to share? Lots of Arabic families, uh, families from um, Eastern Europe and um, Sudan. Russia, Sudan, um, Hispanic families. Mm -hmm. I think just growing up or living in a certain area in Omaha, there's a culture of violence that um, is predominantly an African American community. North Omaha it has shootings every day, and if you're growing up. So, also Native I'm sorry. Fairly large Native American. Native American. So, which also has a culture of, of violence um, in the in the group. So it's very important um, to, as we do this work, to be very sensitive to some of the cultural issues and how to deal with that. Um, in New Orleans, we're predominantly African American, but you know, it also relates to poverty as well because a number of years ago I did a study, you know, I was really concerned about the interactions we kept seeing in our African American families and so one of my colleagues, um, African American social worker I work with, I said let's bring in a group of middle class African Americans to see what that interaction looks like and of course the interaction of middle class American, uh, African Americans in general looks like any other middle class person, you know, so it's poverty plays a very 
big role in that. And I also do a lot of work in Florida where it's not just Hispanic, but it's where they come from. So certainly Cuban versus Haitian versus you know, all different traditions there. But if we're going to do this work and build a relationship with the families, it's very important to be sensitive to those cultural traditions. You're mentioning the culture of violence. You know, um, but a lot of people don't don't realize, you know, and think about since they've been raised in a violent environment, the very negative impact on the child. I'm actually working with a, a couple right now. Originally started working with a man related to domestic violence, and these people fight. They fight in my office. They obviously fight that way at home, and they have a three-year-old and a one-year-old. And I'm finally, I just, I. They really fight in the office, which is quite something. I mean, I've seen couples where, you know, time out and they'll stop. These keep going at it. And I finally said to them, I said, you know, do you ever thought about what it's like for your children? You know, and they looked at me and they said, it's not good, is it? I said, no, I didn't, you know. And I'm not particularly directive, you know, but a lot of people just don't think about that. So um, those cultural issues. The other thing that comes up across cultures a lot, of course, is uh, discipline and how you discipline, you know, and, and keeping that relationship while we're trying to get people to discipline in a more appropriate, appropriate way. Okay. Um, infant mental health in general, and I don't know how many of you come out of a behavioral background, what I'm going to be talking about in this training is much more of a psychodynamic background. Um, there is a um, more behavioral technique that's used um, for some interventions early on, parent-child interaction therapy. I don't know how many, how many of you are familiar with parent-child interaction therapy? A number of you. Um, in, in that work, which is, again, m a strong behavioral tradition, as you know, some people say they use it as young as two. I'm not quite sure how you'd use it as young as, as two, but this is a different approach, much more of a psychodynamic approach. And it deals much more with the internal world of the child. So it's not just the behavior, but it's the meaning of the behavior. And it's the meaning of the behavior to the child and the meaning of the behavior for the parent. And as we go more into child-parent psychotherapy, which is what our focus is going to be, learning more about those, those meanings. Um, um, so this is just an overview of um, training and I don't really need to go over that. It's what we're doing and what's done after training. So that's on your PowerPoint. Um, these are some of the risk factors. I probably reviewed all of the risk factors. You've brought up other ones. Um, uh, we, did, we didn't mention the lack of, of prenatal care. Um, teen mothers. I guess a lot of you are seeing teen mothers. And in the court, there probably are a lot of teen mothers. I assume in general there are. Um, and then one of the issues that comes up with a lot of the cases that we, we deal with is um, one parent or the other being in or out of jail. Usually it's related to um, drug involvement as much as anything else. But for the baby, it's separation and loss continually and lack of stability. Um, these are just some of the settings. I think, I know there was some discussion about trying to get some of this training into regular training programs. I think if we could get it into social work programs and psychology programs and pediatrics and law, I'd love to see it in law. My son, when he was in law school, told me he took the family law course. He was the only man who was in it, he said. And uh, I mean, it's just really unfortunate that more of that needs to be there because particularly uh, lawyers who deal with families and those who work in, in juvenile court don't have any background related to child development and children and that type of thing. Okay, so we'll let this, we're, that's just more stuff related to that. Any comments? I would say another uh, risk factor would be uh, children with disabilities. Absolutely, yeah. And there's not enough, um, you're absolutely right, there's not enough on that children with uh, disabilities and special needs. Um, one of the other editing things I'm doing is I'm doing, uh, we, we're, I'm editing a special section of um, child development on child development and disasters um, based on the fact that for the last four years I've been dealing with a disaster environment. 
and um, doing that with Ann Maston as the co-guest guest editor. Um, someone submitted a paper on uh, children with special needs and disabilities and disasters. And boy, that even before I saw that paper in our work post-Katrina, huge issue. No, you know, special kinds of thing, uh, special situations. So, yeah, thank you. I'll, I think I'll add that to the PowerPoint because it makes a lot of sense. And um, yeah, this this paper that um, we I've now accepted um, for the special section whenever it comes out is really interesting. I mean, we we learned that how um, you know I mean it was really sad you know in terms of the range of needs that were not being addressed. You know, I remember actually vividly this was a we did a lot of the emergency work right after the. Katrina and this mother was just hysterical because her son, it was a teenage son who was paraplegic and his wheelchair was in a flooded home, you know, and he was, I mean, it was just, that was it. But there were a lot of things with young children that came up all the time. And then if you want to look at disruptions, however the disruptions occur, so children with special needs who are displaced in another school and all of that, that's a big issue. What is the Oh, um, oh, th oh, I'm sorry. Oh, but I also know I answered a question right over here, and of course the people back there couldn't hear. I'm sorry that I wasn't sensitive to that. Um, what I mentioned was I'm editing a special section with Ann Maston, the other guest editor of the journal Child Development, a journal sponsored by the Society for Research and Child Development on child development and disasters. And when she mentioned the issue of disabilities, there's a section on children with disabilities and disasters. And I was saying it's a very much of an under-recognized and under-addressed areas. There are lots of things I've learned that I wish I'd never had to learn about disasters in the last four years, but that's one of them. There are quite a number of other things. The issue of young children in general in disasters, oh my heavens. I mean, at the shelters, there weren't even necessarily diapers, no idea of play space, no idea of respite for the parents. You know, you've got all these volunteers there and not doing things that are needed for the children but um, actually we we set up a child care center on we were doing just a, a footnote while the while the microphones coming um, so we were um, 80 percent of the first responders in the New Orleans area lost their homes and so you all probably read or saw these cruise ships that came in to Julia Street Harbor that housed the first responders well we actually um, New Orleans was evacuated and we were in a third floor walk up in Baton Rouge but we came into New Orleans all the time because we were working with them and we stayed on the boat with the with the police so we convinced the Coast Guard and FEMA and the police department that if there was going to be some sense of normality we had to get families back you know and when they first went on the boat there were like 40 children and we said no we really need to get families back so that was late September by November, we had 450 children. Well, we realized when we were getting the children back, which obviously was important for the families, they needed schools, and there weren't schools open in New Orleans. So we got, we worked with the Department of Education and the superintendent um, in Jefferson Parish that was next door where they were opening the schools and others to enroll the children in schools. So we enrolled them on the docks in schools. And then a school bus came to pick up the children, and I never forget one of the uh, the chief's look when the school bus showed up to pick up the children. But for the young children, of course, we needed something more. We needed a child care center. And the parents needed respite. So we set up on the two boats something called Camp Carnival, which essentially was a child care, it was the Carnival Cruise Lines, a child care center that our mental health people staffed. And we also got SAMHSA volunteers to staff. We said to the SAMHSA, please send us volunteers that know about child development because we're setting up a child care center, and I think they really thought we were crazy. But um, they got it after a while. And what was so important when we talk about trauma, and it's relevant to this work, so what's the first thing these little children did in the child care center? They played hurricane, of course. As they played hurricane and their parents watched them play hurricane, the parents were freaking out, no, don't do it, don't do it, because, you know, everybody's traumatized, including us, you know, at that point to some extent. 
So um, we said to them, no, why don't you just kind of take a walk and take a rest, and we're going to let them play a little bit too. But um, the whole issue of young children in disaster is one that isn't addressed in their needs, you know, and so we've been kind of harping about that, so hopefully that'll be more into uh, planning in the future. It's just amazing. Um, you know, so the, f the work that all of us are doing here with young children has huge applicability, you know, because there we're dealing obviously with issues of separation and loss and displacement and changes and not the usual supports that you have for families. Okay. So now we're going to move into uh, infant caregiver relationship assessment. This is based on the work of Judith Crowell. Anybody familiar with that research model? Do we have some developmental researchers here? Judith Crowell did research um, uh, with this model, um, and we've adapted it for clinical use in court settings. Other, uh, some other colleagues have adapted it in various ways. We've adapted it again. And in your packet of materials, what you'll see um, in addition to this PowerPoint is a bunch of other things that we found really, really useful for our court work. First of all, one of the things that's in your packet is um, developmental scales. And you might wonder, why am I putting developmental scales in your packet? Um, it's because you really need to have an awareness of normal development. So that should be in your packet somewhere. When we do training in infant mental health, I have a year-long training program. We meet every week, and people do the cases and that type of thing. One of the things that they have to do as their assignment is to observe a low-risk, normally developing child We've had actually four babies born in our program in the last year, so we have a easy to get, uh, low risk, normally developing children. But um, the reason that's so important is when you do this work, most of the children that you're going to see are developmentally off track. They're not off track because they were born that way. They're off track because of abuse and neglect. So you've got to immediately say when you see a, an 18-month-old you know, something's going on here. Usually it's related to language. That's the most common type of thing. So we, that's one of the reasons I included the developmental, developmental charts. Um, so there's birth to 12 months and 13 to 30 months. And I don't know if I have the other one in here. But you can find developmental charts anywhere. But like if you're going to go do an evaluation on a child, you refer to a child that's 14 months, you refer to a child that's 24 months. And I talk in months because months makes a huge difference. Um, that just take a look at what that child ought to be doing, you know, and so that you, you get it in your head. So anyhow, that's a very important component. Um, and then um, we'll go into what this assessment looks like. Um, most of you probably know something about attachment. I'm not going to review attachment in general, but you probably have, you know, heard of secure attachment and insecure attachment and disorganized attachment. Um, and in the secure category, there's generally one secure category, although you actually can have secure and disorganized in some ways. In the insecure categories, you have avoidant and resistant, two different categories. You don't really need to know that. Within the group that's been abused and neglected, you often see this disorganized um, attachment. And with that, and it's important to recognize that, you get some of this glazed over behavior in a little kid. You can see you know, a little 14, 15 month old just sort of wandering around vaguely. You get that, uh, that type of thing. And, and so this assessment um, relates to models of attachment, but it's really the relationship and the meaningfulness of the relationship. Um, so we, we modified this clinical assessment. And I'm not going to talk at you okay, all day. I'm going to put on a video in a minute to show you what this looks like. The other thing that is so interesting to me about relationship assessments is that a, a child's relationship is unique 
to the caregiver with whom they're relating so that you can have a child look very different with the mother and very different with the father. I have an extreme example I can show you that um, we often use when we're training um, a multidisciplinary uh, audience, particularly with, with judges and lawyers in the audience. What I've learned in working with judges and lawyers is it has to just hit them in the face. You know, a lot of the things we work with are pretty subtle and we'll look at subtle differences. And they, I, you know, sometimes when I'm thinking of using a new tape, I try it out with one of the judges that I work with. I say, what do you think about this? And they said, oh, no, it's not going to work. You know, it, but um, I have one that's um, actually somewhat more subtle, a little more, actually not that subtle, but it's really interesting because it was, it was a relatively, it wasn't actually a court case. It was a relatively low lower risk case and we did this assessment with the mother and the father and it looks really really different with both of them so um, these assessments tell you a huge amount about the relationship so if you have the opportunity when you get a referral to assess the child with more than one person when we do our, our work for the court we always do the bio parent the foster parent or whatever you know the relative placement or whatever so that we get a sense of that child relating to different people um, just so I'll alert you to what um, is useful to know related to the Corral assessment. We put together um, suggested toys uh, for different age ranges. That's in your packet. And because you're going to ask me about the toys, so I want to let you know that's in your packet. We also put together um, developmentally ordered play situation toys. So we gave it to you in two different ways. Um, it's useful. You don't have to use these toys, but people are always saying, what toys should I use for what ages? So it gives you some ideas. You can use whatever you're comfortable with. We also, um, I also included um, instructions for this task because people say, you know, what do I say? Well, you're not going to end up reading these instructions, um, but it does help you. And what we actually tend to do when we do these evaluations, we have a playroom. We prefer to have a one-way mirror. We can't always have a one-way mirror. Some of you may be doing evaluations in homes, which gets a little bit challenging for doing this. So you have to try to find a quiet space in a home to do it. But we are able to do it in an office as well. Um, I'm going to walk over to this side just to, for a little bit of diversity here. Uh, and um, we usually keep this just post it on the door for the people who are doing it just to remind us of the different things that um, we might need to say and for instructions and that type of thing. So we gave that, that to you as well. Now, it is a model where it's good to stick to it reasonably well, but it's not a research project. It's a clinical evaluation. And clinical evaluations give you much more leeway than research projects, and, and you know that. And then the other thing that's in your packet interaction checklist. They're very similar. The checklist is simpler than the rating scales. I'll be talking a little bit more about why we use this and we may even do a little exercise ourselves in using this. Um, we have a coding manual with iterator reliability that where we code these things blind for pre-post assessment for research purposes. This, particularly this one, the clinical interaction rating scale is really, really helpful for people when they do the evaluation to have to write it up for court. Because um, I know judges get very frustrated if people come in and say, oh, the child's doing better or the child's doing worse or whatever else. That isn't what we want to communicate to them. What we want to communicate with them is what the child is doing or what the child is not doing. You know, that there's more positive affect exchange between the child or you know, the mom never looks at the child or something like that. What actually is going on in the interaction and then what you do after that is you interpret it for the judge, what it means. You know, the judge is going to make the decision about the child, but you're giving them much better information than they would have otherwise. They don't see these children. I mean, Judge Lederman encourages the children coming into court. I don't know about Judge Johnson, you know, but we encourage that to bring the children into court. But basically, you know, the court's a strange situation for the child, so the child may or may not be like they would ordinarily be. So we need to bring this child alive for the judge, and we have a paragraph to do it. And this information is really, really helpful. That's why I'm giving you all of this, so you know how this all is re related here. So the Crowell procedure 
is um, 10 minutes of free play, eight to 10 minutes of free play. If you wanna do six minutes, it's okay or whatever, but generally you do free play. And there are free play toys. Um, I don't know if I gave you the list of free play toys, but you know, generally it's things that encourage interaction. So you might have two little telephones, you might have a ball, uh, you may have puppets, you know, you'll have some things they can do together, just all kinds of, we have a free play basket. It doesn't really matter what your free play toys are, except that you do want them to be um, toys that might encourage interaction. Um, then you ask them to do cleanup. And the way we do that, if we're behind a one-way mirror, you know, in our playroom that we used to have before Katrina, um, we had kind of an intercom thing where we could just buzz into the room. You can knock on the window. You know, there are all different ways to just ask them to transition. You go over the whole procedure first with the parent or whoever you're doing this with. Um, then we have several structured tasks. The first one is bubble play. Um, one thing I have to warn you about bubble play is you have to make sure to be renewing your bubbles. I don't know how many of you use bubbles, but you know, if they're trying to do bubble play and they don't, can't make bubbles, it's a little frustrating. But you rarely see a child or a parent or a caregiver who doesn't have a good time with bubble play. And if they can't have a good time with bubble play, you know, it tells you a fair amount. Now, some of the younger children, you may have more trouble with bubble play, and so you have to make developmental decisions there. Then we have three to four structured graduated tests. Um, with increasing degree of difficulty. So if you're dealing with an 18-month-old child, you would start with a task that was really easy for an 18-month-old, and you would move up. Often, in Florida, they use three tasks. We, the original model is four tasks. I think it's good to use more than two. It's good to use three. And for the, by, by the time you get to the, the third or fourth, whichever you're using, the child is going to require help from the caregiver in some way or other, and you want to see how they do that. Do they help facilitate it? Do they scaffold them? Do they do it with them? Do they take over with them? Are they critical of them? Are they unaware of the developmental level of the child? It allows you to do all kinds of things related to that. And then we do a brief separation reunion. It's not an attachment paradigm. It's just a brief separation reunion. And what we look at there is does the, does the parent um, tell the child, you know, I'm going to go out for a minute and I'll be back or whatever. Now, for kids who are in care, you know, we might decide not to do the separation reunion. If they're, I mean, we'd like to do the separation reunion, particularly if you're doing more than one assessment because it tells you about the relationship with the different parent. But, you know, if they've had lots and lots of disruptions, you know, and you feel it's just going to, you know, be really, really insensitive. The other thing is you don't want to stop the separation too long. You know, children, depending on their developmental age, it's normal to get upset with a brief separation. It's like two minutes or three minutes. If they really, really get upset, we'll discontinue it. But I have always had to teach people what we mean by really getting upset, you know, because if they just whimper a little bit, we're interested to do that, learn about that, and then if they can, you know, um, use self-control or play with the toys or whatever, and you're going to see some separation reunions. So that's um, what the, the sort of structure is. And what we're looking at is um, maternal behavior that's particularly important related to attachment and separation and the relationship. Um, and so I'm just going to briefly go over some of the behaviors we look at, we look for. Now, the, if we go back to these scales, um, and we're going to do some of this together with these scales and observing some of these tapes so you see just how we do it and what we look for and that kind of thing. So this is just sort of an overview of what we look for. Obviously, parental responsiveness for the separation. Do they prepare the child or not? Um, I just mentioned uh, how to set it up again. That's kind of the overall structure um, with an easy task, slightly more difficult and more difficult. And you say, why are we doing free play and why are we doing structured tasks? Well, what's really interesting, and it was an eye opener for me, I have to say, is that some parents are really good at free play and can't do structured tasks at all. They kind of take over for them and the relationship seems to devolve in some ways. Other parents, um, uh, really can't free play that well. They're not used to playing with their children and they just, and 
I'm sure you've seen this all the time, those of you who are working with these uh, parents and children. But when you add a little structure for them, then they're able to somehow play with the child better. So you really want to see both situations. It gives you more diversity. You now, some of my colleagues who do a lot of work in this area will say, I don't need all of this thing. I'll just observe them free play and do an evaluation. And, you know, you can learn a lot just doing that. But the other thing about that I like about this situation is it introduces um, various degrees of stress. So, for example, the more difficult task introduces more stress. The cleanup introduces a little bit of stress. But the other thing is you see transitions. A lot of children have a lot of difficulty with transitions, particularly the children that we see. But also, some children have more difficulty with transition because the parent or caregiver doesn't prepare them for a transition. So those of you who have young children, if they're very happy playing with a toy and you say, no, I'm going to take that toy now, and now you have to do this one or you have to do this, what will they do? They'll fall apart, you know, unless you say to them, oh, I know it's really fun with this toy, but we've got a really good one to do now, you know, so let's switch to this one or something like that, you know. And, and then there are certain children with various types of diagnoses that have more difficulty with transition. So it allows you to see that. And I feel like the evaluation helps guide, help, helps guide the treatment because you learn a lot about what's going on in the, in, in the interaction with the evaluation. So we um, either have a one-way mirror or a glass with a curtain. We often actually prefer a glass with a curtain. We often see people of color. And if you're going to video, the glass is better than the one-way mirror. But you know, it depends what you have, so that's ideal. Um, the other thing is that you don't want to do this evaluation in a playroom with lots and lots of toys. You want to do it in a room that doesn't have lots and lots of toys, because our toys aren't really very interesting. And if you have a playroom that has other toys, that's what the kid's going to go to, and you can't keep them on task. You know? so, um, and everybody always makes mistakes. In doing in setting these up, it's just part of what happens, you know. And they apologize for the mistakes, and we do it too. So I'll show you a tape where I'm showing you an example of this, and all of a sudden we realize that we left this little kitchen, play kitchen in the room, you know, or something like that. You know, well a play kitchen is much more interesting than our toys. So it, you really need a playroom that doesn't have a lot in it. Um, and we, we put the toys usually in a cabinet. That's what we used to do. We don't have a cabinet now, so we just sort of have them up, up there. And then the free play toys need to be taken out of the room before you do the structured toys, because again, it's too attractive. Can't get them to focus on the structured toys. And then we always ask the parents to take away the bubbles with them during the separation, because we don't want a child to be there drinking bubbles um, or spilling them all over for that matter. Um, Sometimes the child can wait outside the room. We don't always do that, and we have young children, so you just have to go over the instructions with the parent. Um, and then let them know we're going to let them know when to start the new next test. The nice thing when we could communicate with this beeper telephone is they'll forget and we'll say, you know, just go on to the next one. Um, it's really helpful if there's another person there when you administer the task, just because you got the camera and the, all this kind of stuff. But sometimes you can do it, and sometimes you can't. And so these are, again, some of the free play toys. Animals are good, too. Um, a doll's house, if you can do that. Um, we actually don't generally have a doll's house in the room now for free play, but it's nice if you can do that. Play food in your free toy basket is really nice. We have a lot of children, obviously, who have issues with uh, nurturance and being cared for, and they really go with the food, and you see what they do with the food, and do they share it, and how does the parent deal with it. Play food is really useful. Um, OK. You want to observe the infant or the young child with a parent or caregiver to understand the relationship. You look at the behaviors. You look at affect. I'm somebody who looks a lot at affect. And your observational skills are crucial. They really are. So you have to depend on your, your eyes and what you're observing. So some of the kinds of things that we look at. Um, do, these are just general behaviors. Do there seem to be a, a comfortable interaction in play? And when I show you the videotape, you're going to see not the first one I'm going to show you, which is just a short one, but I'm going to show you a longer one. You'll see how that differs with the mother and father. Is there aggression? Is the child withdrawn? Is there aggression on the part of the parent? 
Um, you look at affect on the parent and the child. Is there eye contact as well? How about the affect, the behavior regulation and the affect regulation? And then the style of the child, and is the parent in tune with the style of the child? Um, how does the child interact with the caregiver? Does the child look to the caregiver? Does the child prefer the stranger to the caregiver? We're strangers there. The child should not be preferring the stranger to the caregiver, obviously. Um, is the child cooperating, compliance or non-compliance? Temper tantrums, we not infrequently see temper tantrums. Um, is there persistence in a task? You get referred to these kids who can't pay any attention, and you've seen them very persistent in the playroom. By the way, and, and people are quick to think about passing judgment. So we get referred children, like you get referred children, where they're aggressive and out of control, and they've been kicked out of two child care centers and all of that, and they come into the playroom, and they attend, and they're quiet, and you know they're like little angels in that circumstance. I remember there's a child psychiatrist who used to say to me, you see? And I said, look, <laughs> they're in a playroom. It's safe. There are toys. They're getting 100% attention from the parent and from us. Why wouldn't they be that way, you know, unless they really can't control their behavior in one way or another? So you have to be real careful not to pass judgment. One of the things that, that I've often said is um, I, I have three children who are young adults now. And my um, second child, my son, was a really, really easy child only one of the three that was an easy child. And I always said to myself, it was a good thing I didn't have that one child because I was thinking, what's wrong with all these parents? It's so easy to raise a child. You know? But I mean, I, it's very easy to you know, pass that judgment you know, when you know, there's something wrong with this parent because the kid's out of control. You know? But the, it's rare in our playroom that you don't get these children to really relate in some positive way you know, because of the, the situation that they're in. Okay, and then for parent behaviors and affect, um, you know, these are just some of the kinds of things that you look at. Intrusiveness is very, very common. We see that a lot. And these are some of the behaviors that we look at to see change before and after when we do this um, evaluation. And again, the child behaviors are parallel. Um, I love the dimension of enthusiasm, and I'll show you um, as we go along the course of our two days some tapes where you really see a change in that dimension of enthusiasm on the part of the child and really enjoying being with the parent. I think it's a really good indicator of um, you know, a successful uh, relationship building intervention and, and treatment. Um, so these are just some of the things that we look at, and we'll be going over this in more detail when we look at the tapes and look at the scales, you know, but um, who, who leads the interaction? One of the things that um, we do a lot in child-parent psychotherapy is um, help the parent learn how to follow the child's lead, not always initiate and take over. Um, is there physical contact? You know, I don't know how many of you have done these evaluations where you see this little kid, this two-year-old who is, you know, about as far away from the mother as you are from me, who skirts the room in that way. It's a really important red flag. That isn't what two-year-olds ought to be doing. They ought to, you know, be closer with physical contact. So the physical contact's really important in how close they are and how much distance. Um, and then, very often, uh, parents are fairly intrusive as well. Um, during cleanup, are they compliant? Do they have a temper tantrum? That's a really important time for transition, you know, because these are attractive toys. They don't want to clean them up. So, um, you know, different ways that they may relate to the child in that way. And believe it or not, on videotape, we have parents hitting children. You know, it's not reportable if they just hit them, if there's not, you know, but I mean, or yelling at them or calling them names or all kinds of things, and they're being videotaped, you know, so we see that. Um, love to see praise. And then the negative discipline. Threatening them, if you don't do this, you're not going to get a snack after we leave here. Um, or derogatory statements, you're bad, stop acting up. You know, very, very common. Um, under those circumstances, grabbing the child, you know, the, that kind of physical aggressive behavior. Um, 
Other behaviors that we observe, use of negative words. I was talking to somebody just the other day, and we were commenting that a lot of these parents, you know, wonder why their three-year-olds use these words that they use. <laughs> you know, not a big surprise. <laughs> But they don't, you know, like this couple I was talking about, you know, the language that they use. And, you know, I, I, I didn't want to be directive, but, you know, the, I just did want to tell them that that's how children learn. If it's good, they learn it. And if it's bad, they learn it. Um, and some of the other behaviors is they're smiling, that type of thing. And then you can also look at parental style. We generally, um, though we like to, to be knowledgeable about parental style. We generally don't put that in our report for the um, judges. It's a little too complex, but some of the other behaviors are really useful for them. So with this relationship assessment, and we're going to move to videotapes now, you get observational data on the relationship. Um, the post-assessment provides information on changes in the relationship. Um, and this is how we evaluate the interventions that we're talking about. So, and it also forms the basis for learning how the relationship is going. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the write-up tomorrow and what we might put in a write-up for the, the court and what that might look like. Okay, introduce you to child parent psychotherapy. Um, the, the, the book that, um, that I put together and actually, I'm going to be talking with a publisher about doing a, a second um, edition of it. Was really focusing, really focuses on young children and trauma in a number of different settings. What the publisher may be interested, I hope, with the second edition. The reason I say I hope is there's just not that much literature out there on young children and trauma. We published some things in the Infant Mental Health Journal, but you know, like what to do with children who appear in the child welfare system, those who are in the court system. We worked also with, um, with children um, that, where they may be identified by law enforcement. Betsy McAllister Groves in Boston works in the Child Witness to Violence Project where you know, they pick up these young children in the pediatric clinic. So a whole variety of settings and what you do in terms of evaluation and treatment. And really the focus on, on trauma, which is so prevalent if one asks the question. It's not so prevalent if we don't. I, last, last week, this last week, um, there was a grand rounds related to stress and young children. And, um, you know, the issue of trauma came up, that it really um, is not something that where we know what to do that much. So child-parent psychotherapy is really was developed originally Selma Freiberg and then Alicia Lieberman, Patricia Van Horn, others of us working in it as an approach to working with young traumatized children. Alicia and her colleagues in San Francisco focus a great deal on domestic violence. And we see abuse and neglect, some domestic violence, community violence. We, we have modified it to be used in court settings, and that's really what we're going to, to focus on. But the model is um, one that really um, can be used with children who aren't exposed to trauma. Obviously, it's a you know, relationship-based intervention strategy, but because we see so many traumatized children and don't have enough um, interventions that are that effective, we found this to be particularly useful. So, this is a, a very long PowerPoint, and I don't like to talk at people for a very long period of time. So what we're going to do is go through some principles. I'm really welcome your questions or comments, and we'll use some video to illustrate things that we're talking about. So the first beginning of this is to look at um, what one really needs to have as background. And one of the reasons that I try to give you some of the background that I do is that it's very, it's very relevant to doing this work. So observing behavior. We can't emphasize observing behavior enough. I think we spent all morning observing behavior because you can see how much you learn that way and how important it is. Also, working collaboratively with other systems. So years ago, I started to do some work with the um, police department, New Orleans Police Department, because we wanted to reach these children long before they ever get to mental health people. And the only way to do that was to raise awareness, just like juvenile court. You know, it's sort of taken for granted when you have a judge in your state like Judge Johnson, and I'm sure you have other excellent judges in your state. I happen to know him better than others. 
But to me, it's just mind-boggling to think that the first time somebody pays attention to the fact that a child has a significant delay is when they're adjudicated dependent <coughs> in a juvenile court. You know, why? Now, obviously, with early intervention and outreach and all of that, one should be able to identify them earlier. Or, you know, very good training for child protection, but they fall between the cracks, you know? So one of the things, actually, that we've done in terms of collaboration with other systems is a number of years ago, I worked with two judges and two lawyers, and we're making copies of this for you, to put together this technical assistance brief for um, the Juvenile and Family, National Council of Juvenile and Family Court judges on questions every judge and lawyer should ask about infants and toddlers in the child welfare system. Why did we do this? Because it's, they weren't asked. And, you know, if you go to a judge, a random judge, juvenile judge somewhere, and say, do you know anything about Part C? They'll look at you in general. Not Judge Johnson, not Judge Lederman, but a lot of judges. What's Part C? Well, Part C is obviously very relevant if a child is adjudicated dependent because the chances are they have a delay and they need to know about it. So what we did here was talk about all the different things that they should ask, should think about asking. There's a sheet in the middle that they put that they can put on their bench book so that they will remember to ask the question. And then we have, including mental health, and then a little bit of science, not a lot, a little bit of science, because um, they want to know why you're interested in this and why it's important. Actually, I had a judge, I was doing a training maybe a month ago, a judge came up to me and said, could you give me some information, I think it was about brain development. And he said, don't send me a 40-page article. <laughs> um, but just, you know, if you could send it, if you could cull it down for me, you know. But, but the science is very important for them to be able to, you know, learn these things. So anyhow, the idea of collaboration is crucial. Um, also, acting as a conduit between parents and child's experience. So it's not just the behavior. It's not just the parent's behavior, and it's not just the child's behavior. But it's the child's experience of what the parent's doing, and it's the parent's experience of what the child is doing. So for example, when the parent says to her two-year-old son, you're, who, who goes and hits her, you're just like your father. Ter you know, you're bad like him and doing the same things to me or something like that. And by the way, I've seen that in a lot of situations. You know, so there has to be some understanding of that experience and helping to do that, and that's part of our role. And then capacity for self-reflection. And that's crucial for work with young children um, and if one's going to do this kind of work, you know. So um, just an example of that. So years ago, we were referred two-year-old twins who had witnessed the shooting death of their mother by their father. And we've written about this article. Um, and I was just reviewing it the other day because I was writing something on trauma and reflective supervision. We're doing a special issue of the Mental Health Journal, and I was revisiting that. And I remember vividly seeing these little boys. One of the people who was working with me was doing the treatment, and I was observing through the one-way mirror and, you know, just finding myself getting really, really angry. They were very dysregulated. They were out of control. The affect was really off. And I had to reflect, why was I feeling angry? You know, well, what I was feeling angry about when I reflected was why these little two-year-olds should have to go through an experience like that, you know, and what that was about, you know. And then I was thinking, well, if I was feeling that way, what was the therapist feeling, you know? And so the, the idea of self-reflection is very important in this work and to be able to do it effectively because otherwise it gets in the way, you know. So, for example, I was supervising one of our child psychiatrists who was seeing this mom who was really depressed with her two-year-old. And the two-year-old kept wanting to play with him and not play with the mom. And he would come in week after week for supervision and complain about this mother. And so finally I said to him, I said, you know, I, I said, well, let me ask you something. I said, how do you feel about the mom? You know, and he looked at me, kind of wondering why was I asking this. And I said, no, I really want to know. He said, well, I really don't like her. And I said, okay, well, why don't you like her? 
And he elaborated that she just sits there and she's depressed and she doesn't play with the child and all of this. And I said, well, you know, maybe you're more attractive to him than she is, but maybe there's a way you could help draw her in. What are some ideas? And we talked about some ideas. Well, anyhow, came the next week for supervision with a great big smile on his face. And, I, and he showed me this video. And the mom was interacting with the child for the first time. And so I said to him, well, what do you think made the difference? He said, well, I think I really looked at, you know, what was going on and that, you know, I was able to open myself up more. So that kind of self-reflection is very, very important because so many of these people we work with are doing things that we might feel fairly negatively about. Okay. Um, I've already talked a bit about the things we need to know about. Very important, you know, knowing your developmental developmental stages. And if you have some question when you see a child, just go back and look at the chart and see where that child ought to be. Knowing about adult development because of everything that goes on with adults. Um, diagnosis, we're going to talk a little bit more about tomorrow. And then we talked a little bit about cultural kinds of issues that are very, very important that one has to be sensitive to. So in terms of child development, and we've talked about this this morning in terms of um, the evaluations that we were doing. Um, understanding social and emotional and cognitive development, attachment patterns, um, what a young child should be able to do. How many of you do evaluations with, with moms or dads who expect, I don't know, we often ask, you know, what they expect their child to do, and one of them was expecting the child to be talking at nine months and, um, you know, walking at seven months or something like that. I mean, really off with developmental expectations, which is common, actually, with uh, young mothers. Um, but, you know, one of the reasons they might get really irritated with a child is that they expect them to do something that they're not able to do. Or even um, a lot of things that we see, particularly with them, having them hold their own bottle, you know, when they're three months old or something like that. You know, so very important, you know, in a nice way. You know, I also brought along this, this tape that we um, developed that um, it was an intervention we were doing with a really young mother, actually, a 13 13-year-old mother called Speaking for Baby. And at some point, I will show you that tape also. But, you know, expectations that this 13-year-old had for this child had no basis in reality, and consequently, she was constantly frustrated. So that's very important. You know, knowing developmentally what's going on, knowing when separation and loss might be more of an issue than other times for a child. And again, the meaning of the children's behavior is very, very important. Um, we've reviewed um, some of these issues, going back to self-regulation and affect, um, which is very important. And then, you know, even in terms of development, like cognitive, when should a child be, be um, playing symbolically? And if they're not, why aren't they? You know, important to know about things like that, just so you have a sense of, again, your expectation for the child, but the parents as well, and then other kinds of anxieties, um, which obviously is common in children who are in foster care or end up in the court system, the issue of loss of parent or loss of parent's love, um, the guilt and shame, you know, so many children in domestic violence situations feel it's all their fault, you know, those types of things. So just important to bear all those things in mind. And then in adult development, um, that one in the middle, entering into parenthood as a normal developmental transition, well, you know, many of these parents don't enter into parenthood as a normal developmental transition, and they haven't even gone through some of the other kinds of issues that go on early on. Um, so um, also the issue of, you know, how many of these parents, like um, a child who's brought up in care, who then at the age of 15 has her own child, and she's brought up in care because uh, her own parents' parental rights were terminated. And when she wants to go out with her friend, she leaves her child with her mother. Well, can't do that, you know. So even understanding, you know, helping them understand the demands of parenthood, their own individual issues, and that type of thing. There are some really good, too, that we may want to introduce, um, unless you already have them in Nebraska, some of these evidence-based parenting programs that are so very important. And I'm sure that within some of the courts here, they probably have those kinds of, no? Uh, we actually don't have much, but something that complements uh, this is the Parenting Act of 
Anyone know of any uh, more interactive parenting programs? You do. Healthy beginnings, yeah. Yeah, we've sort of um, envisioned it out of the Miami court team model as, a, and we've we've had an uh, an infant team in place for over a decade with the New Orleans courts, but the Miami model has a lot, has many many of the components that, you know, little by little we've kind of integrated into it, but we discovered, um, didn't I mean the judges kept telling us, you know and we knew that sitting in a classroom like this and learning parenting isn't going to do much good for parenting hopefully it does some good for this but um uh and and so you really need to be more interactive with the children and actually we've modified this scale lynn katz my colleague down in miami modified our relationship based scale to actually use to evaluate their parenting program so that you could see some of the kinds of behaviors before and after with this more um, very active kind of parenting program. So it's, it's really a very important adjunct to the other work that, that goes on. You know, I mean, as Roy Muir, a psychologist in, in uh, Toronto, says, you know, parenting comes naturally, but it becomes naturally the way you learned it. You know, so you certainly can unlearn and relearn, and everybody in this room didn't have great parenting. I know that. Um, but we make a lot of effort to relearn it you know, in various ways. So maybe everybody in this room had great parenting, but mm -hmm. I had to learn some of it myself, actually. Um, okay, so another body of knowledge. We'll talk a little bit more about this tomorrow. It's DC 0 to 3, and actually I should change that DC 0 to 3 R um, in terms of diagnosis. And what diagnostic classification 0 to 3, and we really use it 0 to 5, does is it just expands uh, how we understand what's going on with young children. And we have a crosswalk, and I believe I copied for you the crosswalk um, to DSM. For some reason in Florida, they crosswalk to ICD-9. I have no idea why, but most places crosswalk to DSM. And even though you have to do the DSM diagnosis for reimbursement, it really gives you a very good feel for where the child is. Um, and so we'll just briefly go over diagnosis tomorrow, and then you know, certainly there can be more of that if people are interested. In we also um, need to understand how disorder in in impacts on the parent's capacity to relate to the child and to protect the child, and you know, really paying much more attention to that, um, as well as on the child. You know, so I think it's really stepping back, not pointing fingers, but sort of understanding how all of these interactions take place, and then cultural inf influences. Um, are very, very important, and we talked a little bit about that. And then, of course, historical traumas, too. Um, continually, you know, I think we have to bear in mind what came before and what we're trying to change. There's no question in our mind, I really feel strongly, that if, you put, if you're able to put this comprehensive program in place for children who are abused and neglected through the court system, you really can break that intergenerational uh, cycle. Of, of abuse and neglect. You really can. Um, not in all cases, but you know, in a lot and make a big difference. So I know some of you are concerned about prevention and early intervention, and there's no question <coughs> that this is effective. Again, it's not going to be for 100%, but this is a very high risk population. You know, and I'm interested in those who, who can't do it, but there are all kinds of reasons people can't do it. I mean, the people who have substance abuse issues who really can't get into recovery people who have economic concerns that then they become homeless, um, and psychiatric problems, you know, that are undiagnosed or not dealt with. All, a number of different things can play a role. Okay, so what are the core competencies? What do we need to, we need to know? Um, observing behavior. Um, and that's what we've been doing, is observing behavior. The caregiver's behavior, the child's behavior, um, and how they impact on each other. So it's not just the behaviors. You know, what's it like for that little boy we saw 
when his mother is struggling with him so versus what was going on with his father? How does that impact on him? And, you know, obviously the relationship that that child has with the father is much more satisfying with the father than for the mother, I assume. I mean, it looked that way. Um, how do you move the interaction forward? And, you know, how are you going to make how are you going to work with this diet to make it better? And always the perspective that we're just there temporarily intervening. It's this parent and child who have to figure out how to move this forward, and so we have to try to help them with that. Um, clinical case management is a huge component of this work. When we did our first um, uh, work in Florida that actually was funded by the state, um, the Infant Mental Health Pilot Program, we had to account for lots of hours that weren't therapeutic hours. We had to account for those five phone calls for the one visit that came in. <laughs> and we had to account for going out there for a home visit and the parent not being there. And so we actually put in, I think it was um, at least eight to 10 hours of engagement. That's what we've ended up calling it was engagement. So there's a lot of case management. You know, those of you in the, in the room who are psychologists, weren't trained in case management unless you came out of a different program than what most psychology programs are. Um, social workers learn much more case management. If we do infant mental health work, be you a psychologist, social worker, counselor, or child psychiatrist, you're going to do case management because you have to, to some extent. And also, there are some programs, and I remember when I was at Menninger, they always had a, someone who did all the case management, and we didn't have to do it on our our cases, you know, you really miss something if you don't do the case management. And they miss something because that's part of building the relationship, and the relationship is crucial for the work. So um, there's also crisis intervention. You know, your family ends up homeless, or something else happens, or something like that, or someone's in prison. There's all kinds of crisis intervention that occurs. So how do you keep that balance for being an advocate or Keep, or just keeping the relationship, keeping the alliance when all of that other stuff is going on. Those are issues that come up all the time. Um, and, you know, part of it is talking about it. The boundary issues, you know, some of us who, you know, do a fair amount of training and work in this area, it drives us crazy with some of the boundary issues that people get into. But someone was just telling me earlier this week that, there was a woman who came in, and actually it was a doctor, MD, who was seeing her. And he was doing therapeutic work, and she needed birth control. And she was desperate to get birth control. She'd been in recovery or whatever, and obviously it was an inappropriate boundary. But there's all, you're going to be pushed. And if one is pushed with boundary issues, you know, really need to discuss. Also, always need to discuss the issue of reporting. We're all mandatory reporters. And how you do that reporting and how you keep an alliance with a parent is, is very, very important. So um, those are issues that come up in terms of core competencies. Um, so this idea of acting as a conduit, this idea that the child's behavior has meaning, a lot of people do not see this aggressive acting out, externalizing behavior as having any meaning except being bad. You know, and we know that. And so. That's very, very important. I'm going to show you a tape in a minute related to behavior having meaning. Um, there may be all kinds of anxiety contributing to the behavior. Um, and, you know, and even the reawakening, the earlier losses or earlier traumas and the re-experiencing that comes up. Um, if you listen very carefully, you know, um, a loud noise and the child loses it. You know, um, we used to have in our building a fire alarm that went off randomly. I don't know how many of you are in buildings where fire alarms go off randomly, but if a child's had a traumatic experience, they just really often lose it with a fire alarm. You know you've made progress when they're able to not lose it with a fire alarm, but there are all kinds of things that, that come up related to that. Okay, so what's, what gets complicated with child-parent psychotherapy is um, trying to figure out when you do an intervention how everybody's going to react. So how the mother might react, how the father might react, how the child might react. So you've got this complicated dyad um, related to the inner, inner. You know, will the child's behavior be disrupted? Will the play be disrupted? Is the whole thing seen as intrusive in some way or other? 
um, and can the parent hear what you're saying. So any kind of intervention is going to impact on that whole system. I'll give you an example of one that was inappropriate. Maybe that's easier than the appropriate one. So the child is getting out of control in the playroom. The child is starting to climb. The mom's just sitting there. Then the child is starting to climb to the point that the child's potentially in, in danger, climbing up by the window or whatever. Mom's still sitting there. So eventually the therapist has to go and restrain the child and get the child down and take over for the parent. Okay, and then the parent, you know, looks really down and dejected and somehow incompetent and whatever else. And how does the therapist who had to intervene keep that parent in? We actually have an interesting example that I'm going to show you on tape of a situation like that where the therapist did quite a good job. But I, um, there was someone uh, I was working with where she just totally took over for the parent and the parent was sitting there and looking and she never brought the parent in. And you're going to lose. The, and you know, uh, I was. I try to do reflective supervision, and I try to be sensitive. That I really do. And most of the time, I really am. And I think I was in this situation too. But I did say to her, "How do you think the parent's feeling?" Had to, had to. And she had no idea how the parent was feeling. You know, because you can't take over for a parent and not bring the parent in and expect that they're going to feel good about it, because they're they're probably not unless you know they're used to people just taking over for them but that's not our role our role is to help them be able to do it themselves but you have to make sure the parent is ready okay and then how many of you have done trauma narratives in other types of settings yeah trauma narratives um, you know are are important but people have to be ready for them, and um, and they're and they're complicated. I find with young children and how you do that trauma narrative, um, and whether the parent is ready, you know, to to co-construct that parent trauma narrative with the child. More often, we've seen a child in a playroom playing out the trauma, and the parents unable to listen or watch and wants it to stop. I I think that's much more common, related to that. So important to work with both of them related to dealing with the trauma. The other thing is that it's likely to reawaken in the parent, for example, is there, if there's domestic violence or something like that. And children, children play out what they see and what they hear. You know, I remember years ago, a number of years ago, when we were, we've done work, as I mentioned, with the police. And um, I don't know if any of you, some of you, I don't know if some of you are from Omaha where you mentioned there are areas where there's a lot of violence. Well, if you're with little kids in those areas where there's a lot of violence, the kids play out the violence. They play out the drug deals. They play out the shooting. They play out all of that because that's what they see and that's what they do. And very often that's really, really hard for parents. So um, it's, it's important to balance both. And that's what gets complicated about child-parent psychotherapy. Um, so will hearing the parent's story be traumatizing for the child? Or can the parent tolerate the child's narrative? Um, if, if the father, say it's domestic violence and the father's the perpetrator, how are they going to feel about that? What if the parent's the perpetrator? All kinds of issues that come up. Very often, actually, um, what we see with domestic violence is that the child has probably closer feelings toward the perpetrator than the, than the parent, you know, unless somehow they've been the victim. And then they might have different feelings about that. But then they might feel like they're to blame, too. So it can get very, very complicated. Okay, so those are some of the kinds of things that a child would need from a perpetrator parent um, in a trauma narrative, but that's specific to domestic violence um, more often. And, you know, the other issue is reframing of parents and motives. Um, yeah? I, what do you do when you think a parent has been a perpetrator of some type of abuse, but it's not explicit yet, it's not out, and you can tell that perhaps that's the case by the way the child acts, but you don't get any admission from the parent. What do you do? Well, there's also the issue of reporting in terms of what do you do there, too. Yeah, I mean, it, and that's a situation that, um, that you know, we all are, are confronted with. Um, it, 
you know, under some circumstances, there are ways that you can get some help with that. For example, if you um, suspect it could be sexual abuse, um, like we've partnered with our Child Advocacy Center, so before we'll start to work with them, we refer them there so that somebody else will, you know, do an interview there to um, sort that out for us. That's been an extremely helpful thing for us, you know, because, um, you know, you're kind of caught in that way, too. Um, you know, at some point, and I, I think that's the importance also of working with a team, <laughs> You know, you're going to have to look at what it is. I mean, videotaping is helpful, too. And, you know, whether you're caught between whether you're helping them or whether you're going to have to report, you know, I think at times is, is a really difficult situation. So, you know, I would try to gather as much information as one could, try to share it, you know, with a, a colleague in, in some way or, and, and try to sort that through. But we, there are circumstances like that, I remember a number of them, where if you don't have the evidence, though, you know, you just, you have to, go, like, keep going and try and do what you can do, you know. But as I say, that CAC thing has been really helpful to us in sexual abuse. We've, um, we just finally, we, not that we discovered it, but, but you know, at all, but we, we realized we were having a number of these cases come up that were really troubling us a great deal, and so that was really helpful with sexual abuse. But other kinds of abuse, um, it's a dilemma. Yeah? Given the um, uh, very young developmental and uh, cognitive and language development of kids under three, I'm just curious about what of these things that you're saying here, apology, atonement, can those children really understand or is it really more that that's what the parents need? Yeah, uh, it's more what the parents need. Yeah, I mean, children, I mean, it was really interesting. This woman who was doing um, Grand Rounds, who had done a fair amount of work um, related to loss, that was the area that she was focusing on, was talking about, you know, some of the, some of the issues of developmentally what a child can understand when. No, a young child isn't going to understand that. You know, because a young child cognitively, you know, has to have that capacity. It's more the parent. That would be more the parent. Yeah. Real change, on the other hand, that is what the child needs. Is the yeah. Real change. real change is what the child needs, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just follow up on that a little bit? So say you know it was sexual abuse, and the parents are still not admitting it. The kids have verbalized that. Then would you still go ahead with this model and try and do the or would you say there's contraindications to using it? If, if the sexual abuse had been um, substantiated, then I would have to, I would sit down with them and we would talk about it and say, you know, we have substantiated sexual abuse. Um, you know, obviously that's reported at this point, so it's a bit beyond us in a way. If, if the child and parent are going to be together and they're not going to, you know, do anything about it at that time, yeah, I'd work with them. You know, but we've done all the things that we have to do, yeah. It's hard to think of a substantiated sexual abuse where they'd be together. Unless, yeah? It isn't hard. No? Is there a case you had? Well, we have kids that are verbalizing it and yet they're still visiting, they're still... Oh, for visitation, not living with them, no, no, but visitation. No, no. An unsupervised visitation, God forbid? Supervised visitation, hopefully? Yeah, I've heard that too. I've heard that too. So what do you do in that case? Well, you obviously do what you can to keep them safe. I mean, the judge is ordering the visitation and you make sure it's supervised. Um, and then, you know, help them with that, yeah. That's, that's all you can do, I know. It's very hard when our hands get tied. But under those circumstances, you know, where all the protections that can be in place are in place, yeah, that's a real hard one. I've seen that as well. Um, on, on the other hand, can we give people, is, you know, if the perpetrator is getting some treatment? No. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs>
Well, well, I think what I would do in that case, if I could, you know, so that the non-perpetrating parent has custody and there's visitation with the perpetrating parent, there would come a point where I would um, ask for a hearing with the judge. You know, that, that's happening. Is in this instance, it appears that both parents have been perpetrators. Then I definitely want a hearing with the judge, yeah. I mean, we'll sometimes do evaluations. I didn't show you that particular tape, but this 11-month-old, you know, who we were doing an evaluation was so fearful with this mom who had severely abused her to the point that she just couldn't hold it together at all. And we asked for a, a hearing with the judge, you know, and... Um, you know, and share that experience, and then you know, and then, and then we have to live with the fact that the judge is going to make decisions that we can't do anything about, and we have to just be able to do our best for the children. I know that's really hard. I can probably think of at least ten situations right now off the top of my head like that. You know, but I, yeah, I think it's a bit of a dilemma, and you know, the more we educate the judges too, hopefully, the more that that'll be effective. Yeah. Yeah, so that, you know, I mean, it, one of the things you do learn from working with courts, and I think that's one of the reasons we also wanted to do this training and indicate it in there, is obviously we're, we're the experts outside the court. But, you know, the more education the court has and the more knowledge we, we bring to them. And I, you know, started out this morning talking about this, this case with the, it wasn't Judge Lederman's case, obviously, because I wouldn't be doing that with her, but it was, you know, another judge. And I said, but it's not in the best interest of the child. I mean, I was talking to the judge privately about the case. She said, but it's the law. You know? Sometimes we have to live with that, even though it's hard. <laughs> so, um, okay. And then, the, actually, this is very relevant to what we're talking about, the capacity for self-reflection. You know? I mean, we have to do that. And one of the things that I'm going to talk about a little bit more tomorrow is, you know, reflective supervision, issues of vicarious traumatization and self-reflection. It's very hard to do this work alone. If any of you are going to do this work and you're on your own, then find a peer group or something like that, you know, because I think it's near impossible to do trauma work without someone to talk to about it. And I don't care, you know, I mean, I do a lot of teaching and a lot of supervision and do some of the work myself. I have to have someone to talk to, too. And the more junior people who I train or know at times, they're going to hear about something that's going on with something I'm doing, because you, you have to. Um, it's just too tough. So you have to be able to reflect. Um, and you have to figure out where you are. So here I'm hearing people who are very frustrated or somewhat frustrated. And you know, you know, where do we go with this? Kind of thing, and I think that's part of you know how the team processes it and goes through. Um, reflecting on the emotional responses that the diet arouses in us, you know. I, I think one of the greatest things that I deal with is my own feelings of inadequacy. Um, have I done everything I can in directly and in consultation with the people that I'm consulting, supervised with, and then the opposing attorneys? Attorneys are also very good at making yeah, that's absolutely true. One of the things that I, I think I'm finally coming to with some of this work with the court, I don't know why it's taken me so long to come to it, but I've realized that 
often the people who make us feel most insecure are the attorneys, not the judges. You know, and, and going into the court setting have learned that if there's a way I can ally myself with the judge, you know, when I'm there as an expert, I'm doing something, I'm talking to the judge, you know, and they, they hear me and then they can help with some of the, the attorneys. But I, before, I, I just saw the whole thing as adversarial in some way or other, you know. And the other thing that's very interesting is, you know, I remember we had a number of judges who were fellows of zero to three. And we were at a meeting in that way, and I said, you know, I feel intimidated going into a court setting. And they looked at me, and they said, you feel intimidated? <laughs> and so I said, yeah, let me tell you why. You know, and we started to talk about it, and they kind of understood the position of the expert and then kind of sorted out. But with that, gave us more information about how we can be more helpful in that setting. But boy, I can uh, remember um, a case I was on just a few months ago where these lawyers um, I mean, it was awful, you know, and, uh, he, he, and you know, you, they get you to question, are you really an expert, you know, <laughs> after a while. I had the latest one, and I finally, I actually saw in an, another deposition I was reading related to another case, a, a great answer for this. I don't know if any of you have ever faced this, so I'm going into court, you know, and I've got a strong CV or whatever, and, you know, I know a lot about development and all of that, and this lawyer starts to say, you know, what expertise does this person have to be in this courtroom talking about what's in the best interest of these children? And I'm thinking to myself, you know, she, look, where does it say on the CV that she has this expertise and this expertise and this expertise, you know, looking at a point by point, you know? So on this deposition, I'll just share it with you in case you ever need this in a court setting. This um, person in the deposition had said, you know, this is what I learned in part of my training, in my graduate training, or this happened to be a doctor in that training. And then the training to do this other stuff is specialized training that you get in this way and this way, which is not reflected in my academics or whatever it is, you know. But it, it's absolutely true. But I think one has to understand that. Otherwise, you go in court and get attacked by these lawyers and never want to go into court again. You know, as opposed to, I can tell you that, and, and they're a lot younger than I am, these people in, in the court settings. You know, I'm thinking of a number of people in Miami where we started training them from scratch. And they'll go into that courtroom now, and they'll stand up. And, you know, in front of Judge Lederman, it's easier than some of the other judges. But even with the other judges, they'll stand up, and they'll talk about it, and they'll feel OK about what they did. And I think that's the role that we have to have in court. And I think we need to provide more training for people to do that. You know, um, and that's why we have this additional information because, you know, people can't refute what you see. You know, they can tell you it isn't important or something else, but they can't refute what you see. And I think that's really important. You know, or reporting to the judge, you know. I understand there's an issue here, but I can tell you what this child is doing over and over and over again. And from our experience and from the experience of science or whatever, this is what it usually indicates in most cases. You know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if everybody heard that the attorneys need to know what to ask and how to ask it. Or what information I think they need to know. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Um, attending to the emotional responses of the therapist. Attending to the therapist rescue fantasies. How many people and how many people who train here have always said we should take this child home and they'd be much better off, you know? Right. Um, and supervisory space, which is really very important. And we only bring that up. I mean, all these issues we've been talking about here, it's very relevant. Okay. Um, we've talked about the developmental tasks of childhood. I don't need to go over that again. We did that um, in terms of the evaluation that we did this morning. Um, just a little something on brain development. I think the most important thing to know about brain development, and judges are quite interested in brain development, and I actually have a PowerPoint I'm going to show you tomorrow that has some nice slides about traumatized brain. I also, just a week ago, in The Economist of all unlikely places, came across an article with some research related to poverty and stress and brain development. I actually have a copy of the article with me, and I'd be glad to give you the reference as to which issue it was in. But it was really interesting. 
I thought, because we know a lot about the issue of stress and brain development and trauma and brain development and how the neuronal connections, you know, there are more and more neuronal connections, but they're impacted by trauma and by stress. Well, what this article talked about that made a great deal of sense, and there's good research related to it, was that people who live in a poverty environment have much more stress than people who live in a non-poverty environment related to all of the factors in their lives. And so that impacts on brain development. And they were talking actually about working memory in young children and how that part of the brain that develops working memory is impacted by stress. I was really, you know, interesting article and I think has a lot of validity to it um, potentially. So I can tell you that the judicial system is very interested in brain development. Somehow that science of brain development really appeals. I'm doing a training in May to Louisiana CASA and they called me up and said they wanted training on brain development and I said you really don't want a training on brain development. You really want a training on the science of early childhood development and trauma and the impact. They said, oh yeah, that's, that makes sense too. But people, you know, really highlight this issue of the brain development. So it's just a little bit of um, stuff on brain development, experience dependent brain, and how the neurons are connected. And that's in your, your PowerPoint. I'm not going to go over any more of that. And a little bit about stress. Um, but you know, brains of children exposed to violence, less brain mass. Um, and so, and also it's experience dependent so that the pruning of the neurons goes in a direction, a negative direction as opposed to a positive direction with stress. So, um, and in terms of temperament, does everybody know about temperament? There are easy temperaments and more difficult temperaments, but they're also impacted in different ways. But that's all relevant body of information related to this work. Okay. Um, what I would like to do right now is put on a DVD of um, two different DVDs. First one um, is a little girl who um, came to us because she was incredibly dysregulated a number of years ago. It wasn't a court case, although um, we eventually had to report um, because Clearly, maltreatment was taking place. Um, but there's an intervention that took place that I'd kind of like you to see that's, that's an intervention that can occur in a child-parent psychotherapy situation. I also want you to sh show you our DVD of Speaking for Baby as well. So I'm going to do that one first and then talk a little bit about Speaking for Baby and that one just so we're putting a little bit more um, substance. Um, I don't like to just talk at people. And then after, after we do this one, we'll take a, we probably have to take a little break, bathroom break. And granted, she was a young mother. And the one I'm going to show you now is a young mother. But, you know, we have a lot of moms who are older, you know, or dads, you know, but who have never been nurtured. And that relationship with the therapist becomes very important. That's why the boundaries are very important, too. But, you know, someone who cares about them. We also see this, frankly, with the judges you know, that depending on what the judge is like, and I'm sure that's the case with Judge Johnson, as I say, that's the only judge I know well in your state, but that, you know, these are people who listen to these young women, maybe for the first time, you know, and they may be hard on them at times too, but, you know, somebody who cares about them and cares about the children, and, you know, it isn't, again, that you're going to reach all of them, but a lot of them. Um, we're not done with that PowerPoint. It's a very long PowerPoint. We'll keep coming back to it, and we'll come back to it um, tomorrow or some more today. But I, I really like to intersperse things with videotape just because I think we learn more that way and that we can go back to the videos. I was going to say, if any of you have videos that you feel like you'd love to bring, bring in tomorrow, uh, you know, share with the group if you have permission or whatever. But the reason I wanted to introduce Speaking to Baby as we, as we talk about child-parent psychotherapy is we find this intervention really, really useful, and other people really like it a lot. And in fact, we've even put together a little brochure. I actually have to edit it while I'm here. Um, to, for a little boy or a little girl to speak to their mom about various kinds of things that should or shouldn't be done, which is interesting. I'll be glad to share that with you. I was just doing, we consult with Head Start and Early Head Start, and I was at a meeting with them last Friday. And um, 
they were trying to put together some things for their parents, you know, and we commented on this and they thought, oh, that's a really good way to reach the parents if it comes from the child, like don't use some of that language in front of me or if you fight, you know, better not to do it in front of me or one of the things that some of our parents do is they get these little kids to kind of dress up and be like little grown-ups when they're two years old and three years old and but if they hear it from the child as opposed to somebody telling them it can make a big difference well um, the reason we developed this we were working with a program for for teen moms and actually we developed it at the time that baby came out that movie came out baby talk but we originally called it baby talk but we couldn't do it because the movie came out so we call it speaking for baby <laughs> Um, but we were working with teen moms and found it really, really hard to get things across to them because they don't like to be told what to do. Teenagers in general don't like to be told what to do. So we had to try to figure out ways to communicate um, with them uh, related to um, the, those issues. And so this was a program um, in conjunction with the National Council of Juvenile Family Court. Not, no, I'm sorry. Uh, um, the um, an intervention program, not not with um, judges. This was a program for teen mothers, um, and um, there was an intervention for the children. There was a child care center. There was GED for the moms, as well as nutritional guidance and parenting guidance. And then we did some parent-child interaction, and we kept continually being frustrated. And so one day in the nursery, um, one of my colleagues started to do this speaking for baby thing and then we happened to we had permission to video and we started to video some of this so what you're going to see on this this tape um, is what we did um, and uh, when I was uh, it's was the National Council for Negro Women and um, and um, that had this program in place so in terms of therapists speaking for baby what the therapist is doing then is describing how the baby might be feeling. Um, again, behavior has meaning. And I know one of you came up in the break and was talking about um, your thesis related to behavior having meaning. So, but often, particularly young parents and even older parents don't think about behavior having meaning. Um, so how to understand that. Also, how to tune the baby into the child's developmental needs so that they can be more sensitive. The idea of talking more to the baby, holding the baby, smiling at the baby. There's a wonderful um, video, by the way, um, It Feels Good to Help Your Baby Learn, that was done by Family Focus in Chicago. Um, again, it's set to rap music, but um, it often can get across to teen moms. You know, you, know, you shouldn't shake your baby, you should talk to your baby, hold your baby, that kind of thing, um, that we find quite useful, too. It's called, uh, It Feels Good to Help Your Baby Learn. It Feels Good to Help Your Baby Learn, done by um, Family Focus in Chicago. Um, and it's, it's pretty good. I, had, I use it sometimes for medical students, and I had a negative reaction last year from some medical students because they felt like it was, you know, kind of bias being set to rap music or whatever. But it, one of the reasons they did that was to try to communicate with these young mothers in a language that they might um, might be able to understand and you know and I think also the student was concerned that there was kind of a, a bias related to teen parents but you know teen parents is a reality and you know so I mean we have to deal with it we have to try to find ways to help with that so anyhow um, okay speaking for baby helps moms become more empathic and so Essentially, it's expressing the baby's thoughts in first person. So, mommy, I'm hungry and I want you to feed me. Or, mom, I'm really not hungry now. I really would feel better if you just held me. Um, you know, or it's so, I love it when you smile at me or sing to me. Um, it's really, I like it when you talk to me. Those kinds of things. And the baby says it to the mother. And some people think this is strange but it really doesn't come across that way and it works. And actually, um, I had a therapist who was working with in Miami who did it with a dad. She said, hey, I tried baby talk with a dad and it really works. Because they don't realize that you're indicating maybe to do things when it comes through the, the baby smell. So um, it works for parents who have difficulty listening to advice or instructions. 
and those who are preoccupied with their own issues. Like, um, I think the therapist in that case did some speaking for baby after that with that case. Um, also, teenagers are struggling with their own autonomy. You know, they get pregnant in the middle of dealing with their own independence and autonomy, and so that struggle is sort of over because they're then dependent again in some ways, but that struggle continues, that of the little kid and that of the teenager. And also you can support self-esteem without telling them what to do in that way. So um, why does it work? Because the mom sees her own needs as well as those of the baby, and it helps nurture both of them. Um, you also can see what might be interfering with the relationship and try to address that. It's indirect, it's not direct. You know, a lot of us don't like to be told what to do. But if there's an indirect way to do it, you know, it helps. Um, and also the mom's own feelings, you know, like even if she's feeling helpless, you know, well the baby's feeling helpless too. And so somehow getting that all together. So um, we've done an article in this area if you're interested, which I'll be glad to, to share, but I want to show you the video. all the time with really young children and that probably um, falls much more into the adjustment disorder category. Um, we get hypersensitive that, that is parallels to disruptive. Um, fearful, control, type A, which parallels to anxiety and negative defiant, which parallels to oppositional defiant. So that um, is helpful there. Um, hyposensitive, under-responsive and then we're going to and uh, sensory stimulation seeking and impulsive and those seem to cross over to um, attention deficit disorder just so you you see some of the things that because you know I mean some of these diagnoses are really hard to do with really young children accurately so what DC 0 to 3 R is is gives you more understanding of what's going on um, and then it goes into the sleep and feeding. Um, and then the multi-system developmental disorder. And those of you who know about the work of Grant Stan Greenspan, he and Serena Weider have elaborated a great deal on that um, disorder, which in DSM is going to go into the spectrum disorders. And then um, what DC 0 to 3 R has done is put peer gas on axis two. Um, so you get the over-involved, under-involved, et cetera. And in DSM, that's all going to be in the parent-child relational area. But um, it really helps a lot in understanding the regulatory issues. So those are a lot of the major changes. Three, four, and five are not that different. You know, but what it, the, the areas, well, I mean, there's more in sensory, um, sensory processing, much more in regulation, regulatory disorders, and obviously much more in relationship, you know, and, um, but then you can see where it goes. But understanding it just according to DSM in terms of relational, parent-child relational problems is going to be harder. So having the peer guess there. And actually, there's been some work that's been done um, related to that in that um, we've actually seen, just like we see parallel changes in the relationship-based assessment, the observational assessment, pre- and post-treatment, we also see parallel changes in the peer guess, pre- and post-treatment. And that's been kind of interesting. And Bob Harmon um, had started some of the work in that area you know, before he died. He was a major person with DC 0 to 3 R. So I just wanted to throw that out. Tomorrow um, we'll go over a PowerPoint a little bit more. Um, how many people have the, manu the uh, book, DC 0 to 3 R? And what's required in the state of Nebraska right now related to diagnosis? Is there any like crossover that's being used in any way? Uh, you'd have to use an ASS form, a DSM. Use DSM. Do you think it would be helpful to you know, work with a crosswalk to get DSM as you do the work with really young children? What we require that people do as they 
are doing work in this area, and for those of you who continue, we'll do that, is as you write up your cases um, with the description, we ask you to do a DSM diagnosis and a DC 0 to 3 R diagnosis so that um, you get a sense of the parallel between the two. And I've got, we've got examples of some of those, but um, that's something that, you know, I'd be glad to share the example with you, but we can do it in the future too. Make sense? Any questions? Yeah. Louisiana is not um, one of the best states that's been able to do that. We've been working and working and working and working with Medicaid to, to try to do that. Florida's done a really good job, um, and they actually have a model that's used right now. And if you're interested, I'm glad to put you in touch with some of the people from Florida. They've been working on it for a long time and actually are, are working out that reimbursement very well. Um, Louisiana, though we provide services for young children, haven't yet gotten that Medicaid um, reimbursement. Um, and I, there are other states that have made good progress as well, but as I say, Florida has been making a lot of uh, progress and recently have, have gotten um, reimbursement for these services. They're working in Miami with Magellan and trying to go further with that in other areas of the state. So, but I'll give you those, that contact information. Yeah. What's that? We're here from Magellan. Uh-huh. And we'll say that we will approve family therapy for under five, just not individual therapy. So this goes right along with what you're talking about. You will reimburse family? Family yeah. therapy. Yeah. Because it's very important that the parents right. be involved. Right. And, and that's fine. You know, and, you know, I mean, some people have sometimes brought up the issue, how different is relationship-based therapy from family therapy? It's essentially, yeah. You know, it's just people use a, a you know, different name, but that, yeah, that's excellent. You know, and that's exactly where I started from this morning when I was talking about my work with the judge. You know, because, and one of the things that we talk about is the child, we're talking about child within the system, the child's been harmed in the relationship, so the child has to be healed in the relationship for those who are abused and neglected. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And the, have to do with the family, it's not just individual. Right. Absolutely. That sounds good. They should be able to go in and get five to six family therapy sessions, and then they would need to call in and talk to a care manager and then kick in. They can get more. Did everybody hear that? Or maybe it's just a matter of us knowing sort of the route to go. Yeah. I wonder if there's a way to get that, you know, When you, when you call the 800 number, ask for Amber. Okay. And Are you Amber? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> She's one of our master's level care managers. She'll walk you through the whole process, and there is no cap. You just have to make sure that we have your treatment plan and your progress notes. Okay, that's awesome. Well, we've had the experience of Chalk Eye, and it's working with that person being approved for two sessions at a time, and then having to go through tons more paperwork. Mm -hmm. So it might be worth kind of looking into that. This sounds better because it's five, you said five to six? Well, but five to six sessions. Well, that hasn't been our experience. But okay. Well, it sounds like we need to talk to Amber. Well, the other thing is in terms of the treatment planning that you mentioned that's so important. You know, the treatment planning that we're suggesting in terms of writing this up, both related to the court and related to other things, is like a, a family-based work, the relationship-based work, you know, and um, it, I mean, it's interesting. There are some cases where under certain circumstances, for a little while or per part of a session, you may sometimes have to do some individual in the sense that a child who's been very much traumatized might not either play out or talk out that traumatic experience, but it's still within the context of family work. You know, and I think that that's a very important component. That's the treatment of choice. 
you know, and some people say, but and, and we we certainly have these situations, you know, where, or if the child starts to play out the trauma, the parents say, no, 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 or there's something that happens to intervene. But I think that's the sensitivity of the clinician, and the flexibility, in doing that. Well, I'm very glad we we brought that out. That's terrific. I'm glad you asked that question. So. Um, we have just a little bit more time. So I'd just like to go over just a few more components of um, child-parent psychotherapy. And tomorrow, we're going to go back to this PowerPoint. We're going to look at some more tapes of child-parent psychotherapy. I'm also going to show you some before and after so that you can see the changes that occurred. And then, you know, we can look at the different components that are needed. I also will go a little more over the uh, DC 0 to 3 R um, to see if there are any other questions about that. It might be worthwhile, you know, I suppose people could just learn it from the manual. Or one could do, um, you know, a training or a video training or something like that on, on DC 0 to 3 R, day long training or something like that. Um, so, it, just in terms of a little more, you know, justification for this um, relationship or family-based work, um, you know, one of the things, and you see that very clearly when you see the tapes, if you even think of that really young mom that we just saw, that idea of even physiologic regulation, you really saw that in that interaction, that that child was dysregulated. Actually, that child didn't really seem that difficult if somebody tuned into that child. But the, they couldn't get in sync. And what happened with the intervention is they got more in sync. So you really saw how um, there was more physiologic reg uh, reg uh, regulation that occurred. Um, the other thing that I like that example is, you know, every time that child threw the bottle down, she said, see how bad she is? You know, see, she's so bad. Well, the the young mom really didn't have any conceptualization. The child's too young to hold the bottle. And the child maybe wasn't hungry, and the child maybe had other needs. But it's interpreted that this child's bad. You know, that's this mom's internal working model of the child. So that one has to look at that and be able to change that. Um, and then the whole issue of modeling accepted behaviors. The other tape that we saw, Caitlin, you know, who was out of control. Well, that mom wasn't really modeling any regulated behaviors at all. So how, how was that child gonna, gonna learn? And then when we saw the child become more regulated, the mom also was more regulated so that the, the child learned that she could count on the mother, whereas at first, you know, she hit the mother, she bit the mother, she, you know, the mother wasn't there for her. And one of the things we, talk about a lot is physical availability versus emotional availability. And somehow people have an idea, well, if I'm there, I'm really there. You know, and, and one of the interventions that we do very early on, and I'm sure some of you do very early on, is talk with the, the moms about just spend five minutes that's devoted to this child. The child chooses and you're there for five minutes. It doesn't seem like very long, but for many of them it's a huge amount of time and that idea of changing that framework you know that it's just the child the child chooses what to do and you know take five minutes and then hopefully that five minutes will expand to more time but that whole idea of the emotional availability you know they're there but they're not really there and all of you know you know and all of us know I mean I it isn't that we draw on our experiences as parents to learn this either but you know um, it's very easy to be there and not be there, you know, and so that, but sometimes it's, it's really challenging to be there for two hours, in a sense, you know. So that's why, you know, you start small. And then what happens is that the baby becomes very reinforcing for the mother. You know, that smile or that coo or something else, hey, this is fun, you know, but starting in little, little bitty increments um, is so important for them. So that's just some of Bowlby, um, you know, and I really do like um, that notion of, you know, to really bear in mind, that's why the internal world of the child is so important, you know, in terms of parenting. Sometimes parenting has to be learned, you know, that we are hardwired in a way 
to for that attachment. But you know, you have to have positive experiences to build that. It just doesn't come out of a vacuum. And we talked about attachment. Um, that's just some of the physi physiological markers related to disorganized attachment um, that um, can contribute. And then, as I was mentioning earlier, that issue with poverty and stress is a really important one in terms of physiology as well. Um, some of the risk factors, we talked about that. Um, alcohol, drugs, young parents, depression. Um, and those are just some of the attachment principles related to <coughs> proximity seeking and goal-directed partnerships and that kind of thing. But that's what we're looking for in, uh, to accomplish with child-parent psychotherapy. And then finally, um, the meaning of children's behavior. Um, can anybody think with the videos that I've, seen, that I've shown you today, any kind of um, behavior of the child that has meaning that I didn't talk about? What about the meaning of the behavior, Caitlin's out of control behavior? Yes? I think mothers often are thinking the child is crying at them instead of crying for them. And I think Caitlin was crying for her mother, wanted, wanted her yeah, I think that's a really good example. Actually, talking for baby would have worked there as well. I think, you know, once they were at least, you know, tuned in a little bit too. No, that's a, that's a good example. What about um, the little boy we saw this morning with his mother? That's interesting. I don't like you get away from me. Yeah, yeah. You never did feel him being comfortable with her. What do you think of, what do you think um, the meaning of his behavior was for her? What's that? I, she just didn't seem to get any satisfaction from the child. Like, she felt like the child didn't like her being there. No satisfaction, not tuning in. It was just a burden. And yet she seemed like she kept trying, you know, but um, never really got tuned in in that way. Yeah. Was, was there more to that story that unfolded? Yeah, actually there was more to that story. Um, <laughs> I kept waiting for the chat. That's time. right. I never did do that. I think maybe we took a, a lunch break. Well, we recommended, um, we actually recommended um, uh, dyadic work with mom and the child. And um, so when they came in for the dyadic work, mom, dad, and the child came in. And um, so, you know, when you don't get what you expect, you sort of have to go with what you get. So we tried to work with the triad. But what happened is that um, dad kept being much more involved with the child than mom. and. We actually tried to intervene directly, you know, and try to get her more involved, but it was, it was a hard kind of thing. Um, we felt like um, she was depressed, and um, we never got a clear story about why there was lack of supervision in the home. We had hypotheses about that, but we never got a clear story about that. So we worked with them for a while, and there were some improvements. But, you know, it was a really good example where you have to be motivated to change. And that mom wasn't motivated enough. You know, I mean, to come to therapy, you have to really want to change. Now, that's an interesting issue that I'm bringing up related to the work with the court, because you're ordered by the court. And one of the interesting things I've learned in working with the court is when you're ordered, I mean, any of us in this room are ordered, we're going to be there, I would assume. Well, not everybody who's ordered by the court <laughs> comes. Um, but then, then you have to negotiate that. You know, they're ordered, but, you know, then you have to, you know, talk about what's in it for them, you know, getting their children back in most cases, you know, and try to get that level of motivation there. The only reason I bring that up is that, you know, I mean, it's really hard to work with people who aren't motivated 
to change, you know. But the whole 19-year-old and the sexual behavior, and were there any more answers to all of that stuff, or just no, it was. Yeah, no. He know. left, and there was never any follow-up with that. There was never any prosecution related to that, wow. either. And um, we, you know, tried to work with them and help the child in that circumstance, you know. But actually, it was a bit of a puzzle because if people aren't going to reveal it yeah. in that way, yeah, yeah, it was sort of a strange circumstance. But you know, uh, some of those other situations of exposure to sexual types of things, you don't always get the full answer in those situations. Yeah. In a situation like that where you feel like the mom doesn't budge, would you ever just sit down with her and have her watch the tape? Because I think sometimes moms don't even know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know there's things I don't know, realize I'm doing with my kids, but if I watched it, it would hit me in the face. Yeah. And um, there are many times when we will use the tape for intervention in that way. When you use tape for intervention, you have to be careful about using a lot of the negative parts of it. So you could use a little of the negative and make sure there's some positive in there because otherwise you could lose them in that way. But we do, we do often use the tapes. And then I found the tapes to be really effective at times with work. I remember I was working a number of years ago with a feeding problem. And the mom, she was motivated to change and she was interested, but she just didn't get it. And I don't know how many of you have seen the tape, um, Watch, Wait, and Wonder tape, where there's, there's a feeding segment on there anyhow. And, um, and I didn't have any other tape on feeding, you know, and they had refused, this particular mom refused to be taped. I took this little segment. After she watched it for three minutes, she said, oh, my heavens, that's me. I see me. You know, it was uh, somebody where there was a repetitive, she'd been force fed, and even though she cognitively was aware and she was force feeding the child and the child had a feeding problem and all of a sudden she got it. So it is very useful to use the tapes and we do do it a fair amount of the time. Um, but as I say, <coughs> often taking segments of them edit parts of them because if you show them too much of the negative you can lose them as well but would yeah it might have been would helpful. Would you show it and ask questions like what sure. she see or would you point out how things would be different? Oh I'd probably be more reflective. I'd probably show the tape and say uh, you know I mean I'd probably do a combination you know of let's talk a little bit about what you see here what might be going on you know if they're motivated and then they'll start talking about it and then you can do it too. Yeah it's a very good intervention. Absolutely. So I think it's um, about time to break today. If any, any more questions before we break, or do you have some housekeeping things?